Good afternoon. My name is Michael Kimmage. Uh, I'm a professor of history at Catholic University and chair of the Kennan Institute's advisory uh, council. I'm delighted to be hosting this, our third uh, long view conversation uh, of the fall. I will try to uh, you know, sort of speak to expectations and mount expectations by not saying who we're going to have in the spring, but uh, we will certainly be having spring events. And so keep an eye on Kennan Institute Media and, and your email and other, other things for announcements uh, about that. But um, we're sort of delighted to be at our third uh, such conversation. Let me say just as a very practical matter in advance of today's uh, discussion that questions can be emailed to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org. They can be sent in through Twitter at Kennan Institute, uh, or they can be contributed through the Kennan Institute's uh, Facebook page. And please, for those submitting questions, uh, please you know, sort of mention your name uh, and affiliation, and I'll read your question during the discussion, uh, the discussion period. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome, welcome back Dr. Timothy Fry to the Kennan Institute. He mentioned a moment ago having uh, done sort of internship type work long ago at the Kennan Institute. So it's nice to welcome you back in your capacity as, uh, as, as professor. Uh, and we'll be discussing today a topic that has appeared now and then in the headlines of the last uh, week, uh, weak strongman, the limits of power uh, in, uh, in Putin's uh, Russia. Let me just say a few words before turning the floor over to, uh, to Professor Fry that uh, uh, speak, speak a few words about uh, his, uh, his biography. Timothy Fry is the Marshall D. Shulman Professor of Post-Soviet Foreign Policy uh, at Columbia University. Uh, he's one of the leading scholars uh, in the field of, uh, of Russian politics and Russian foreign policy uh, and has a strong uh, emphasis on the former Soviet Union uh, and Eastern Europe uh, as well. In addition to Weak Strongman, which is Professor Fry's most recent book, He's the author of Brokers and Bureaucrats, Building Markets in Russia, which won the 2001 Hewitt Prize from the American Association of the Advancement of Slavic Studies. The author as well of Building States and Markets After Communism, The Perils of Polarized Democracy, still a timely topic, which won a Best Book Prize from the APSA Comparative Democratization section in 2010. And Professor Fry is also the author of Property Rights and Property Wrongs, how Power, Institutions, and Norms Shape Economic Conflict in Russia, which was published in 2017. Professor Fry, in addition to uh, you know, all these publications and, and teaching, uh, also directs uh, the International Center for the Study of Institutions uh, and Development at the Higher Economic School in Moscow, and is the editor of Post-Soviet Affairs. Um, I won't say anything right now about the book. I have a few questions for Tim after he uh, speaks about the book to introduce it. I'll simply say, and we'll hold it up for our viewers to, uh, to regard what a wonderful book it is. But let me pass the floor now to you, Tim, to say a few introductory words uh, about Weak Strong Men, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. And uh, all books are labors. This one was really a labor of love. Uh, you know, it's a much more personal book uh, than I've ever written. It's directed not so much at an academic audience as at the general interest reader. Uh, and I think, I hope that it's written in an engaging style that keeps you turning pages. Uh, there's no shortage of books on Russia, right? Uh, uh, but I think this book differs from uh, existing works on Russia in three ways. First, uh, rather than focusing on Putin's unique background and occupational history to account for why Russian politics are the way they are, or to emphasize Russia's unique history and culture. Uh, rather, it tries to situate Russian politics in the broader phenomenon of autocracy, and to think about Russia not as a one-party autocracy or a military-led autocracy, but as a personalist autocracy, where a single individual makes most of the import makes all the important policy and personnel uh, decisions. And as we look across the, the globe, we see that there are very common patterns of these personalist um, uh, autocracies in the terms of the way the power is exercised and how the rulers come to office. And uh, one example I like to draw is uh, the Yukos affair, which people often attribute to uh, Putin's 
bad relations with Khodorkovsky, his you know, KGB background and the uh, desire to distribute resources to the Siliviki or to you know, Russia's long history of a fusion of state and private property. But when we look more broadly, uh, we see that when oil prices are high in autocracies, nationalizations as we, like we see in Yukos are very common, much more common. So around the same time that the Yukos affair happened, we had similar expropriations in Algeria, Bolivia, Dubai, Venezuela, um, uh, uh, Chad, and a number of other uh, countries. So, you know, none of the leaders of those countries had a KGB background. None of them had, uh, you know, uh, Russia's unique history. But we see this common pattern. And the point is not to say that Putin's personality doesn't matter or that Russian history doesn't matter, but that the pendulum and how we talk about Russia has really swung to emphasize Russia's unique features rather than the common features it shares uh, with other uh, autocracies. Um, second way the book is different is rather than focus on uh, person, uh, personalities within Russia and tell the story of Russian politics through individual experiences, or to develop a kind of narrative arc of Russian politics over the last 20 years. Instead, it relies on the best social science research that we have about how Russia works. Uh, so the book is, it's really an explainer book that takes the best social science evidence we have on elections, on Putin's popularity, the economy, uh, information warfare, both in Russia and abroad, and tries to translate that uh, evidence for a, uh, for a general interest audience. And you know, I think that what journalists do and what long form writers on Russia do is great, but this is something that's, that's, that's different. It just draws on a whole different uh, source of, uh, um, of evidence. And one hope here is that it kind of turns down the temperature a little bit on the really heated debates that we often have uh, about Russia. The third way uh, the book is different than others is that it draws a lot on some of the adventures and misadventures I've had uh, in Russia over the last 30 years, uh, including, you know, working for the U.S. Information Agency in the late 1980s, which uh, uh, was the best job I'll ever have. Uh, we traveled around with uh, 24 other Americans uh, standing before Soviet citizens in Tbilisi, Tashkent, Irkutsk, Leningrad, Magnitogorsk, and Minsk. And just asking, asking, answering questions about life in the U.S. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, a time, and the, you know, one of the best jobs I'll ever have. Uh, I also talk a little bit about you know what it was like uh, seeing 9/11 happen uh, from the vantage point of uh, a, a bar in Moscow off Mayakovsky Square called Uncle Sam's. Uh, and uh, finally, I talk about what it's been like to run uh, Codirect, at least a research center at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow over the last decade. And I think you know, these anecdotes, uh, some of them are funny, uh, I hope. Uh, hopefully they're entertaining, but I think they also shed light on some aspects of Russian politics that one normally wouldn't get um, uh, uh, without having spent an awful lot of time on the ground in Russia. So I describe the book, it, it, it's, not, it's not really a Putin book, uh, the main point of the book is that we need to look beyond Putin to understand how he interacts with society and with his inner circle and how difficult it is to satisfy both of those groups uh, at the same time. And this forces him to make really difficult trade-offs on all kinds of issues. And you know, from this viewpoint, um, uh, we get a different picture of Putin, not as omnipotent, but having to strike bargains and make difficult trade-offs on a whole host of issues. Um, so that's the book uh, in, in a nutshell. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much uh, uh, for that uh, overview uh, and introduction. I have three questions for you that I'll ask in turn, uh, and then the floor will be open for our audience to submit its questions and uh, for, us to, for us to have a conversation uh, in, that, uh, in that manner. I want to go back to something you mentioned in your opening remarks, Tim, and ask you about research and evidence of which there's so much uh, and it's such a rich aspect of your, uh, of your book. I wanted to ask you as a scholar, obviously you've been uh, immersed in this material for a long time uh, and some of it must have confirmed what you thought already, but I'm curious about what surprised you. What right. um, in terms of the survey data was 
you know, maybe more difficult to decipher or just more, um, you know, sort of novel or unpredictable uh, than you might have expected. So one of the main points in the book is that Russia has been a great place to study autocratic politics relative to lots of other autocracies. Uh, we have far better quality survey data in Russia than in just about any other consolidated autocracy. We have great administrative data as well. I mean, the legacy of the Soviet state means the, you know, the Russian State Statistical Agency collects evidence and data on all kinds of topics. And over the last 20 years, the generation of scholars who, um, who I went to graduate school with and who we've trained um, have really put uh, the study of autocracy in Russia uh, in the center of the study of autocracy generally in political science. If you look at the top political science journals, articles on autocracy in Russia are prominently featured, far more so than at any time in the past. So at the same time that we have this dwindling uh, the, of uh, kind of Russia expertise in terms of sheer volume, uh, among academics writing for other academics, we it, it's been a great uh, period to study uh, Russian politics. So we have great data on election fraud, for example, that is difficult to come by in other settings because Russia produces data at a very fine grained uh, uh, level. We have data on uh, presidential approval ratings. So we have you know, 30 years of monthly data uh, sometimes from two different reputable survey companies about presidential approval rating. And, you know, my, my colleagues even who study you know, democracies in Latin America often are envious of the kinds of data uh, that we're able to get. So uh, some of the most interesting and to me surprising data was, sur was surrounding Russia's attitudes towards foreign policy. Um, so we often hear, and the Russian state often likes to put forward this notion that you know, the average Russian just couldn't live without thinking of Russia as a great power. And that superpower status is something that's just deeply ingrained um, uh, in Russians. And when you look at the survey evidence, it's much more nuanced. So if you ask a question about, you know, do you think Russia is a great power? 80% of Russians say yes. 80% of Russians say it's important, right? But that's really a costless answer, right? That's like saying, you know, uh, would you rather be, uh, would you like to be taller? Yes, I would like to be taller, right? Um, uh, but when you start pushing a little bit and asking them to make trade-offs, uh, for example, there's a question that I like, uh, which says, uh, would you rather see Russia as a great power that other countries fear, uh, but not the most economically advanced country, or a country with high living standards, but not necessarily one that uh, other countries fear. Majorities of Russians for a long period of time have preferred the second option rather than the first. Um, moreover, if you look at public opinion towards Ukraine, uh, everyone loved Crimea, right? Across demographic groups, um, uh, in part because it was costless for, for Russia, in term, particularly in terms of Russian lives. But when you look at something like introducing troops into Eastern Ukraine uh, or even into Syria, uh, where there's the potential for a loss of life, uh, popular support for those efforts goes way down. Uh, and even in 2015, when fighting was hot in Eastern Ukraine, uh, you know, surveys show that less than a third of Russians favored you know, the direct introduction of Russian troops uh, into Eastern Ukraine. And that could have been a viable option. You know, the Russian government could have said, you know, we need to, uh, uh, you know, they could have really valorized the, the, the efforts of the so-called volunteers in Eastern Ukraine, but they've chosen not to do so, I think in part, because they recognize the potential for a backlash. So that, that was some of the more surprising uh, data that I came across in public opinion surveys. You know, certainly that uh, data set is very salient to uh, issues that are, you know, hotly debated in Washington, D.C. at the moment about what's going to come this winter and thereafter, and people who are trying to figure out Putin's calculus vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine at the present moment. Um, let me return to the subject of personalist autocracy, which you've already raised, and I wanted to pull out two aspects of your book's argument that I found uh, especially striking. Uh, and one is that Russia has an educated middle class that makes it somewhat anomalous. 
uh, among the world's contemporary personalist autocracies. And then secondly, and this echoes what you were just saying uh, a moment ago in some ways, uh, Russia is sort of the sole great power or major military power uh, of the personalist uh, autocracies. And this doesn't you know, change the nature of its personalist yeah. autocracy necessarily, but it's just an interesting yeah. uh, point to compare with, yeah. uh, you know, the sort of Venezuelas and, yeah. uh, and you know, other countries uh, that fall into that category of personalist autocracy. So I just wanted to ask you about the educated middle class yeah. nature of Russian society and superpower status and how these two yeah. threads are woven together in your book. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, one of the uh, you know, things that makes Russia somewhat unusual autocracy is this high level of education. Actually, it's, it's level of, of GDP per capita. It's also, you know, uh, somewhat higher than we usually see in personalist autocracies. And I think this makes it a more difficult um, challenge for, you know, President Putin as he tries to balance, you know, satisf satisfying the, the median Russian and keeping them from protesting while at the same time also delivering targeted benefits to the inner circle to keep them uh, uh, from uh, withdrawing their support for him. Uh, now, one thing about Russia's middle class, though, is that it's, it's very state dependent. A lot of them work for the Russian state. And this creates a somewhat different dynamic uh, than we see in kind of classic theories about how the middle class uh, uh, demands uh, uh, more rights as the, as the middle class expands and as living standards um, increase. Bryn Rosenfeld has a great book where she makes this argument that one of the reasons why we see uh, autocracies with fairly high, with fairly large middle classes, often uh, well-educated middle classes that haven't been able to have the same kind of effect that we would expect to see in other settings is precisely because of the state dependence that makes them vulnerable to um, uh, pressure uh, by the, the state uh, in order to continue to, to go along with the deal. And in some of the work that I've done, you know, we, we show, for example, that about 40%, that for state employees, about 40% of them are mobilized uh, uh, by their bosses during elections to vote. Right. So that gives you some sense of the level of dependence. And on, yes, so the hardest chapter in the book to write was the foreign <laughs> policy chapter uh, for a lot of reasons. One, all of Russian foreign policy in one chapter, you know, who would think that's a good idea? Um, and also because Russia is an unusual, um, a personalist autocracy, and then it does have this, you know, this incredible global footprint, you know, 11 time zones, nuclear weapons, uh, seat at the United Nations. Um, there's one way, though, that, you know, Russia is similar to these other personalist autocracies is that when things go badly, the anti-Western card really comes to the fore. Uh, we've seen it in Turkey. We've seen Orban in Hungary, um, you know, make statements that, you know, could have been echoed by Putin in his Munich speech from 2007. In Venezuela, Chavez tried to create a, a kind of uh, a, a Russia Today style um, uh, propaganda machine that would broadcast news about, um, you know, the, uh, the great things in Venezuela and the bad things in the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, the anti-Westernism seems to be, you know, a function of modern personalist autocracies. And, you know, you could say the ground is fertile in Russia for anti-Westernism, but it does seem to be something that's not certainly not unique, um, uh, certainly not unique to Russia. The other point is that, the, you know, being a, a global power creates difficult trade-offs for Putin uh, because, you know, the more assertive foreign policy is often at odds with the other you know, key policy goal of Putin, which is to develop the Russian economy. And it's not just in terms of sanctions, the more assertive foreign policy often also rewards those groups within Russia who are least interested in leveling the playing field, strengthening, strengthening the, the security of property rights and promoting broad-based economic growth. Um, so in that way, uh, you know, Putin faces a difficult trade-off in foreign policy in the same way that I describe a lot of the difficult trade-offs he makes around elections and around the economy and around information manipulation. Wonderful. I see that questions are starting to uh, amass. I have one further and final question. I'll just repeat the prompt for anybody else interested in asking a question about how to do so 
by email, Kennan at WilsonCenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, uh, or on the Kennan Institute's Facebook page, uh, and send them in. We'll be sure to get the question um, uh, articulated for, uh, for Professor Fry. So here's my final question, uh, and you've anticipated some of it in your answer to the previous question, but it's about Putin himself. Uh, who's certainly not the obsessive focus of this book, but uh, is there uh, in the title of it, at least Putin's Russia. And I think if I understand your analysis correctly, there's sort of three ways in which Putin is falling short. If his aspiration is to make Russia an enduring great power, he should focus more on broad-based economic growth. He should focus more on the construction of an efficient bureaucracy, somehow had in mind the rise of Prussia in the late 19th yeah. century and the sort of importance of yeah. bureaucratic reform and bureaucracy to its power. Uh, in the international arena. Uh, and then third, the issues of legitimacy and stability yeah. that, uh, you know, this mm -hmm. is what makes a great power, a great power that um, it can sort of ensure that it's gonna be around 10, 20, 30 years from now. And I think in all of those areas, you see Putin falling short and that's an aspect perhaps of what makes him uh, a weak strong man. So I wanted to ask about Putin, your assessment of him perhaps in light of these three uh, issues, sure. the economy, so, the bureaucracy, and, and, and legitimacy. Yeah, excellent. So, so the, um, the title weak strong man is something I wrestled with for a long time uh, because I think the text is a lot more nuanced and balanced uh, than the title, but it would be difficult to sell books with a title, the, the sort of constrained kind of strong man. Uh, so, you know, you really need these kind of blunt force titles and, and that's uh, the way uh, we ended up going. But the, the motivating idea behind weak strong man is the notion that, uh, you know, commonly held notion, I think that because Putin faces no open political challenges, particularly now that, you know, Navalny is, is behind bars, uh, that he can do what he wants and that he's omnipotent and that he can just rule through fear and that it's easy to be uh, an autocrat. So the, the, the goal of the book was to recognize that Putin, like other personalist autocrats, faces two threats uh, and they all face this, the threat of protests from uh, the mass public uh, or the threat of being overthrown by people within their inner circle, which also happens. And the, uh, the challenge really is that it's hard to resolve both of those challenges at the same time. Typically, resolving one makes the other worse. For example, around corruption, uh, personalist autocrats will allow their uh, inner circle to use corruption to enrich themselves in order to gain their political support. But at the same time, they can't steal so much uh, that the economy collapses and people take to the street. So yes, there is lots of corruption in Russia. It's well documented. At the same time this week, you know, 10 new metro stations were opened in Moscow. So there does have to be some balancing uh, that Putin has to do. And in this way, it's not so much that he's omnipotent and can just boss the bureaucracy around or, you know, just by sheer dint of uh, his per personal persuasive powers, persuade people to invest in Russia or work more efficiently, um, that he faces difficult trade-offs that are really inherent to the political system. So it, no matter uh, you know, what he does, as long as he is the, uh, you know, the leader of this personalist autocracy, these problems are going to continue. And he might resolve them in different ways, for example, for a long time, Putin was able to largely avoid uh, large, you know, coercion on a, a, on a mass scale. Um, but as his personal popularity is not what it was, as the economy has slowed, as the warm glow of Crimea has faded, he's turned more to rely on more coercive means. For, so from, from my point of view, the it's not hard to explain why Navalny is now in jail. This is what autocrats do. Uh, the hard thing to explain is why he was able to uh, um, do what he did for 10 years by really thumbing his nose at some of the most powerful people um, uh, in Russia. And you know, one argument that would flow from the book is that if in previous periods, Putin could rely on 
the strong performance of the Russian economy, strong performance in foreign policy, particularly around Crimea, um, uh, information manipulation that you know, seemed to be more persuasive uh, before, uh, those tools have all grown a lot more brunt, blunt. So now he has to rely more on the kind of trump card of autocrats, which is to turn to repression and not as a first choice, you know, because it's a very costly uh, policy. It's very difficult to roll back. Um, and it, and it you know, strengthens the security services in a way that might be counterproductive towards other goals. Um, so the, the, the main point of the weak strongman idea it, it is not to say, uh, is to say that Putin faces really difficult trade-offs. It's also not to say that he's gonna fall from power anytime soon, right? It's really about uh, the tensions inherent to this form of government becoming more severe um, uh, uh, in recent years, because you know we know personalist autocrats can stay in power for long periods of time uh, by relying on coercion. We only need to look at Belarus uh, just across the border to see to see a good example. So. Wonderful. Well, one of the many things I like about your book is that it does not argue for an essential Russian autocracy. Uh, it argues for a contingent Russian autocracy, and it also you know, there are unique elements of, of autocratic rule in Putin's Russia, but it also is to a degree normal. It's not to say that you're writing in praise of autocracy, but it's sort of normal in the sense that it relates to other autocratic forms. And that allows one to think perhaps in, in, predictive, in predictive terms uh, about Putin's Russia, which is very, very important for, yeah. for policy formation. Well, let's turn now to our audience uh, and I'll take uh, each question uh, in turn, and we'll start with a question from Thomas Remington, who's a visiting professor of government at uh, Harvard University. Uh, and his question is as follows, Tim. How much does public opinion actually figure into Putin's decision-making on issues like whether to invade Ukraine? So there we are, the issue of the day. So you, you can always count on your friends, you know, to ask you the, the hard question. So uh, uh, I should add, you know, Tom is, is also a part of our team at the, the center at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And, you know, I think that's, um, you know, I don't know. I, I wish I, I think that's the, you know, Vapros Vaprosov. Um, but he's certainly aware uh, of, the, of the public opinion uh, potential public opinion costs should there be casualties in eastern Ukraine. And, you know, I think one of bit of evidence in support of that argument is just how um, the reporting around the loss of life, Russian life in eastern Ukraine um, has been so squelched by uh, the Russian government. You know, you had journalists who've been beaten up for, you know, reporting uh, the graves of soldiers lost uh, uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, you know, not that, uh, you know, Putin orders that, uh, you know, kind of thing necessarily, but certainly there's been a great effort to deny any role for Russia directly uh, in eastern Ukraine. So I think clearly he recognizes that this is, is potentially a, uh, a factor that has the potential for blowback you know, should there be some loss of, uh, uh, of Russian life, it might inform his strategy uh, to try to go for a uh, quicker strike that would expose fewer Russians to loss of life. And if you look at how Russian forces have been deployed in Syria, there also does seem to be an effort to try to keep casualties low. I mean, you know, fighting is still going on in Syria and if Russia really wanted to bear costs, uh, you know, they could do much more um, than they're currently doing to try to bring the fighting actually to a close. So um, and I think, I don't know if this is the, you know, the predominant view, but I, I do think that there is some, uh, he must recognize the potential for blowback. Of course, because the Kremlin does a ton of public opinion polling as well, so. Second question comes from, uh, Adam Blanco, who's managing director of EQ8 uh, Technologies. Uh, and uh, it's in fact, uh, two questions. Uh, what are the three driving variables uh, in Putin's decision-making process as to whether to stand for president or not in 2024? And uh, a somewhat broader and perhaps tougher question, what does a post-Putin Russia look like? Oh, great questions. Uh, so to my mind, um, Taking a step back, so personalist autocracies 
um, have a very difficult time transferring power. It's far more difficult to transfer power in personalist autocracies than in one party regimes where the generals can go back to the barracks or, uh, 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 or, or, in, or in military led regimes where the generals can go back to the barracks and to one party regimes where the leader can go back uh, to the party. There's no soft landing pad uh, in a personalist autocracy. So it's very, and you know, if you look at the statistics, 70% of the time personalist autocrats uh, fall from power in unconventional ways, that is through coups, um, uh, death or um, uh, protests. And 80% of the time, the leaders end up uh, in a bad way, either in jail and exile or, or dead. So it's a very difficult um, problem. So to my mind, for Putin to step down from power in 2024, uh, the uh, direction of the country would have to be quite positive and quite um, uh, uh, and stably positive. So he would have to have confidence that you know, Russia was on the right path. He would also have to have confidence that there were institutions that could protect him should he step down from power um, because the, his successor would yield uh, a great, uh, in, he would have great incentives and great tools uh, to try to clip uh, uh, Putin's wings should he decide to, to step down uh, uh, from power. Um, and uh, he would also have to have a successor in place that he was comfortable and confident with. So it's December, 2021. Um, uh, to see those things happening uh, you know, before 2024 in a way that would give Putin confidence that he could hand over the reins of Russia seems like a very unlikely uh, prospect. Um, now, uh, what would happen in a post-Putin Russia? So personalist autocracies are also um, much less likely to transition to democracies than our uh, military-led or one-party-led uh, uh, autocracies. So in that sense, the, the future for a more open, competitive, liberal Russia looked pretty bleak. On the other hand, uh, you know, the great theories from social science tell us that you know, uh, increases in uh, living standards, rise of the middle class. Uh, Russia is a fairly homogeneous uh, uh, country. It's fairly urban. It's well educated. All those factors, uh, you know, paint a more positive picture. If not for a, you know, uh, you know, a robust liberal democracy, but for a more open, competitive uh, uh, future for Russia looks certainly within the realm. I mean, if you look at Latin America, for example, where all, you know, the vast majority of countries are democracies, weak democracies, um, they often have level, levels of inequality that are higher than Russia's. Um, they, uh, some of them uh, rely on uh, uh, natural resources to, to, to a pretty heavy degree. Um, uh, they're often poor and they're typically much less well-educated than Russia. So if we look at the structural conditions uh, for a more open liberal Russia, the, the, the future looks much better. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. You have these two great theories of social science, both pitted against each other. Um, and the one thing I would say is that because we, we have these two theories pitted against each other, you know, scenarios that are um, certainly positive or certainly negative are unfounded. Okay, let me just repeat one final time the prompt for questions sent by email, uh, canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute, uh, or via the Canon Institute's uh, Facebook page, and everybody is most warmly encouraged to submit their questions. We have one from uh, Matt Rojansky, who's of course the director of the, uh, of the Canon Institute, and his question is, given the book's effort weak strongman's effort to situate Russia and the Putin system within a broader context of personalist autocracies globally. How do you compare the state of Western discourse on Russia to the discourse on other such personalist autocracies? To the extent it is different in Russia from other cases, why might that be? Great, uh, no, that's a great uh, question. Um, so the thing that's common, uh, I, you know, I don't read lots of, uh, 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 you know the, the foreign language reporting on uh, on uh, uh, on these countries, but uh, the thing that's common is a focus on individuals, and we see this repeatedly in writing about autocracies, where the 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 first principle, the first mover, is you need to understand the autocrat if you want to understand autocracy. And again, the the first lesson of this book is uh, 
autocrats come in a variety of flavors, a variety of temperaments. They have a variety of backgrounds, uh, but we see them responding to common challenges in a way that's pretty similar when we look at the manipulation of elections, the manipulation of information, the direction of the economy, the use of autocratic legalism, uh, you know, all of these things are, are, are pretty common. So, the, the, uh, so it's very common for uh, uh, observers to really focus on the personality of the autocrat at the expense of more general structural features that are less fun to write about, they're less interesting, but arguably a lot more important in trying to, in, in trying to explain uh, a policy. And on the, the I mean, the, the temperature around the, the Russia debate, I think is, you know, particularly high. Uh, I, you know, I don't have a good, a, a great metric for it. Um, uh, but in you know talking with colleagues who write on say Brazil or Turkey uh, or, or even on Venezuela, there seems to be kind of less bile uh, in the discussion. My colleagues who uh, write on China uh, often though comment that uh, you know they see a similar kind of you know simplification of Chinese politics uh, by reducing uh, Chinese politics to Xi's background um, and and personality. Um, so I think the temperature is higher, um, and it would be a good thing for uh, someone to do to try to uh, um, uh, to study that. Uh, um, and I think one could do that with some, you know, big data techniques, actually. So graduate students out there, there's a there's a potential topic for you. To understand the autocrat, you have to understand the autocracy. Um, one could almost reverse the equation. Um, Tim, I want to jump in myself with 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 two questions. Um, and you know, one of the focus that, focuses that we have in this series, The Long View, is, is of course on wonderful academic work and writing, but uh, also on policy formation. And I know that this is not something that the book asks of itself, nor should it have, but I wanna ask it of the book, or at least of its, of its author, and start with domestic politics. So you mentioned as a sort of empirical point that 16% of personalist autocracies end up becoming uh, democracies. Uh, and this, you know, if I were to interpret this or sort of translate this into advice for the Biden administration, um, would sort of say manage your expectations. Yeah. It's not a pessimistic book, your, your book, but uh, yeah. you know, don't expect a democracy in Russia uh, anytime soon. Would that be a fair conclusion to draw? Or is there a kind of set of statements we can make about Russian domestic policy that policymakers right. should be uh, alert to uh, in terms of your research well, and, and, and your analysis? Right. So, I mean, one is I, I would hope that the framework of thinking about policymaking in Russia as driven by the dual needs to uh, keep the public from protesting and to keep the inner circle from engaging in a coup uh, could kind of shape thinking uh, about Russia in a way that is more predictive and more um, uh, nuanced than you know, trying to put Putin on the couch and say, oh, he's a risk taker, or no, he's actually a cautious leader, or he has his KGB background, so clearly he must want X or not want X, uh, as, as, the case, um, uh, as the case may be. The other point I, I would make, a, a policy recommendation I would make that kind of flows from the book is to think seriously about Russian society. Uh, I think we're often tr trying to influence you know Putin's incentives um, but you know Putin uh, Russia will outlive Putin um, there will be a generation that comes after Putin uh, moreover uh, you know Russian society uh, is often at odds with what Putin is, is trying to do um, and uh, often dissatisfied uh, with uh, uh, Putin so uh, the notion, you know, it's not so much that we sh that U.S. foreign policy should be all about manipulating uh, public opinion in Russia and trying to foment uh, cleavages uh, 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 among the elite, uh, but to recognize that if we want to influence you know, Russian for Russian policy, you know, part of Russian foreign po Russian policy making, particularly in domestic politics, revolves around keeping at least some portion of the public happy. Uh, so that, you know, suggests that, that Putin is just kind of much more um, uh, constrained. And, you know, the, the, the one bit of policy advice I, I could, would give to policymakers in, in the U.S. if they want to promote 
a more open, tolerant Russia is to take care of business at home because the Putin's greatest success is to point to domestic fissures and polarization and you know, the insurrection of January 6th and say to his people, um, look, you want democracy? Well, this is what you have when you, when you get democracy. We don't have that uh, in Russia. And it's not so much that uh, you know, the Russian government is good for you, but all governments are bad. You know, all elections are uh, fraudulent. All governments are corrupt. So don't get your hopes up. Uh, so to the extent that uh, you know, the US can um, counter uh, uh, that view, and the Russian public is pretty savvy. Um, um, you know, this isn't, the, this isn't the first regime in Russia who doesn't tell them the, the, the truth. You know, I mean, they, they've had long experience trying to decipher state speak. Um, uh, so I think, you know, taking care of business at home would be, would be an important kind of long-term uh, policy goal that would pay dividends. Okay, I have one sort of follow-up question, then we have, uh, you know, three questions from our audience, which I'll turn to right after this one. Uh, about foreign policy, I mean, it seems apparent that the Biden administration is going to be entering into a phase of very intense diplomacy with Russia in the next couple of months around NATO, around Europe, some of the big questions that haven't been discussed for uh, a long time. I think that they should really bear in mind the points that you make in your book about some of the constraints that uh, uh, that matter to Putin, yeah. a population that doesn't seem to want to go to war, yeah. you know, a certain concern uh, clearly about uh, casualties, the, what you mentioned about Ukraine at the beginning of the conversation, that 80% of Russians do see it as a distinct uh, and separate country. Of course, this doesn't guarantee Putin is going to do anything, but uh, these are uh, these are sort of relevant uh, factors. And so the conclusion I would draw from that is that this really is not 1938. Uh, and this is not Hitler who was yeah. looking for any excuse to go to war. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a different setup and situation for Putin. And I think that matters for the diplomacy. He may be looking for a way to avoid uh, that outcome and that could be significant uh, uh, to the negotiations that are uh, clearly about to begin. So in terms of foreign policy, are there any you know, yeah, no, words think, of, of, of yeah, advice? I think, that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Not to think of Putin as, um, uh, you know, uh, blind to uh, incentives, to logic, to changes in policy, um, uh, you know, n n you know, you often get this notion that, um, you know, it's just inherent to the Kremlin's policy that they have to be, you know, gaining territory, uh, or they have to. An assertive foreign policy is just built in to Russian history. It's built into Putin's background as a, uh, you know, as a KGB man. Um, but look, you know, Russian policy towards Ukraine for twelve years. Uh, uh, under Putin was very different uh, for 14 years before the annexation of Crimea was very different than it's been uh, since then. Even in the Soviet period, the notion that uh, you know Ukraine didn't have a, a right to exist as its own kind of political unit would have been a very difficult, uh, a, a very difficult sell. I mean, the challenge for the Biden administration is a, really a great one in that it seems that the three parties that uh, you know. Four, if we want to include uh, uh, Europe, which we very well might, uh, that want to sign, that need to sign off on some bargain that would kind of make everyone uh, uh, um, no worse off than they are now, um, it's is very challenging. If you think of, uh, you know, Jen Psaki yesterday was. You know, immediately batting down rumors that the, the U.S. government was giving up uh, the Donbass uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to Russia. The Ukrainian foreign minister on Wednesday was saying any deal made without Ukrainian um, uh, backing is just dead on arrival. Uh, you know, and, you know, we know that Putin has drawn uh, red lines and the overlap between you know, the common interest of those three groups, the kind of wind set of those three groups, I think is, is actually pretty small and it's gonna take compromise on all sides uh, to kind of uh, at least prevent a conflict from uh, breaking out there. And each side is gonna need some wiggle room because they're not all gonna get what they want. Uh, and you know we hear a lot about the deterrence 
the importance of deterring Russia and using deterrence, and that's all, all well and good. Um, but there's also, we talk much less about the potential for a spiral model where, you know, by trying to deter your opponent, you only increase um, uh, 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 the intensity of the uh, dispute and raise fears that, you know, either uh, didn't exist or you exacerbate them, you know, by, by dint of trying to actually quell them through uh, a deterrence. So finding that right balance between uh, deterrence and assurance, both with uh, Moscow and with Kiev, is going to be a real is going to be a real challenge. That uh, uh, seems to be manifestly the case. Um, let me uh, uh, turn back to our questions. This one from Daryl Staniford of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. How well or poorly is Russia governed under Putin? Where are the policy? Where are policies and decisions based upon effectiveness versus post personal loyalty or connections? Great, uh, great. And as a Middlebury uh, undergraduate, I'm, I'm especially glad to, uh, uh, to take the question. Well, there, there's a nice series of papers that look at the appointments and reappointments of governors in Russia's regions and compares them to the appointment and reappointment of subnational officials in China. And uh, in China, subnational officials are uh, the stylized, as the stylized fact goes, are uh, uh, promoted when they oversee high levels of economic growth. Um, uh, at the same time, within Russia, uh, these papers show that high levels of growth is not correlated with uh, reappointment uh, of, of being a governor, but uh, having a high uh, vote share for a united Russia in uh, parliamentary elections is associated with um, uh, a greater possibility for reappointment. So there's a, you know, a good example of you know, political loyalty trumping uh, economic performance in the incentive system you know, built into, um, uh, into the, uh, the Russian government. Um, another area that I, I find particularly interesting is the banking sector in Russia. Um, uh, Elvira Nabiulina, the, the central bank, the head of the central bank of Russia, is a, uh, a much lauded central banker in the international central banking community. Um, she's done a lot to clean up the banking system uh, in Russia. The number of the sheer number of banks in Russia has gone down uh, uh, dramatically on her watch, and many of those were just pure uh, uh, kind of washing machine style banks. At the same time, you know her ability to close down banks that are associated with very powerful actors is much more limited. So this is a good example of how the Russian state at the margins can improve uh, 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 governance, um, in part because Putin and Nabiulina fear a collapse of the banking system, uh, which you know, that's the kind of thing that does get people onto the street. So at some level, they, they have to provide a you know, certain degree of effectiveness, but they can't make the banking sector in Russia so um, competitive, so uh, have such a level playing field uh, that the inner circle gets upset because they're not able to uh, you know, take advantage of their closeness to the Putin regime. Um, so this is exactly the kinds of marginal increases in effectiveness that you can get under uh, a system like Putin has created in Russia uh, that don't really address the core problem. Okay, we have another question from Ruta Idis of ACG Incorporated. Uh, and the question goes as follows, Putin's Russia is allocating huge resources and enabling the growth of private security companies targeting internal protests and hackers. Could the development of these two groups rebound against Putin uh, at some point in the future? So one of the, the things I talk about in the book to counter the view that Putin is omnipotent is to point out that uh, you know, he governs a massive bureaucracy that's spread across 11 time zones uh, that often has its own interests, uh, that um, uh, often has conflicting interests within the bureaucracy. You know, what the uh, uh, Ministry of the Economy wants and what the Central Bank wants are often, uh, you know, uh, often at odds with each other. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, 
Putin in 2012, for example, int introduced these May decrees that had these very robust targets of economic growth and improvements in governance um, and improvements in bureaucratic performance. Uh, that haven't really happened, um, uh, that have been really a disappointment. So it's difficult for Putin to manage the Russian state bureaucracy that's directly under his control. But you know, we know that the Russian government also operates through proxies that are still one step more removed from uh, you know, official uh, sources, in part because some of the things that the Kremlin wants to do um, require a degree of plausible deniability, such as you know, arming uh, 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 troops in Eastern Ukraine um, or, uh, you know, providing security services uh, 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 in Africa, perhaps for political reasons. And there the possibility for mistakes are just much, much higher. So we had the shoot down of MH17 uh, being, uh, you know, a great example of how relying on proxies um, increases the opportunity, the, the likelihood of mistake. And that's been a really costly mistake. If you think about sanctions policy, in 2014, uh, nobody would have believed that in 2021, Europe would still be on board for sanctions. Most predictions said the Europeans, uh, because of their business interests in Russia, will, be, will bail by you know, 18 months tops. But after the shoot down of MH17, it became politically just uh, uh, you know, impossible uh, to lift the sanctions, uh, uh, in, you know, in many countries uh, in Europe. So, you know, the reliance on proxies, which some people see as a great advantage of uh, the Putin regime, you know, I would argue creates its own governance problems and the potential for blowback, as you kind of rightfully, rightfully point out. Okay, our next question, not quite our final one, our, our, our penultimate question is from Megan Dixon, a lecturer in environmental studies, and no less importantly, a Kenyan short-term grant uh, alumna. Um, and the question is, does Putin's, does, does this discussion have anything to say about the argument that Russia has a particularly hard time managing its large geographic expanse, or indeed the argument that Russia needs autocracy because, precisely because of this factor. Mm -hmm. Some other personalist regimes mentioned are much smaller in literal size. Certainly, this reminds me of my college sort of introductory Russian history textbooks which began, if, if they didn't begin with the Russian winter, they began with the <laughs> indefensible, enormous Russian geography. So that's, that's a, right. a wonderful question about that. No, so uh, yeah, that's right. And I think the, the answer is in the question itself in that uh, a lot of the incentive dilemmas that Putin faces are very common to this kinds of personalist autocracies, regardless of the size of the country. Um, uh, the need to um, manipulate elections sufficiently so that your candidate wins, but not to manipulate them so much that you reveal weakness as what happened in Belarus uh, uh, last summer or on um, uh, information manipulation, you need to manipulate information enough so that people you know, continue to comply with the government, but you can't manipulate it so much that people stop watching. So you need to mix in enough useful information and uh, you know, facts perhaps, or truth um, in order to ensure that people have some level of trust. And as we see, like the trust in Russian state television over the last decade has fallen from around 80% to around 50% um, uh, as TV has become much more uh, uh, propagandized and social media uh, increasing uh, similarly. Um, and on the economy, the same trade off of rewarding your cronies while also keeping you know, living standards sufficient so that people stay off the street, that's common regardless of the size of the country. Um, and, you know, one could make the argument that actually, given Russia's size, a concentration of power in Moscow to the extent that it is exercised today is really counterproductive because you don't recognize the heterogeneity of interests uh, and um, economies and uh, societies uh, across uh, all of Russia where, um, you know, one size certainly might not, uh, uh, you know, fit all. Um, so, you know, the, the, the geography argument cuts both ways. Um, I remember a, a number of years ago, some colleagues 
were asked by the Russian government to come up with a rating system to reward uh, or to evaluate uh, Russian governors. So they had a list of about 80 different indicators uh, to look at. And, you know, it's very complicated. You know, how much, how do you weight them? Which ones are important? Which ones should you ignore? So I had the temerity to, to suggest, well, you could just hold elections. And then, you know, then you would know, uh, uh, you know, how people are evaluating uh, uh, their governors, but that didn't go very far, so. <laughs> So this is the, the, the final question, Tim, and, and you know, please just use it to, you can sort of fold whatever concluding remarks you have into it because it's quite a broad uh, and philosophical question. It comes from Mindy Reiser. Uh, and the question is, what is the future of Russian claims on Central Asia and additionally on other former Soviet republics? Uh, how much power can Russia really exert uh, on the course of these countries uh, and to what degree can it limit their their freedom of action. So this is a very, very large question for you. And if you have any you know, sort of sure. final words of wisdom for us, please just, just add them here and then we'll draw things to a close in a couple of minutes. Sure, so I, my, my colleague, uh, you know, Tom Graham, uh, I heard him say once that we shouldn't talk about post-Soviet Central Asia, we should talk about pre-Chinese Central Asia, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, if I think one of the factors that, you know, is motivating Putin's approach to Ukraine um, is the notion that uh, uh, Ukraine is drifting away, that, uh, you know, there is the notion of, you know, security threat coming from Eastern Ukraine with, uh, you know, greater cooperation with NATO, the use of Turkish drones, military activity in the Black Sea. And I think that's part of the, the problem and perhaps the easier part of the problem to resolve. Uh, but the notion that, um, you know, uh, Russian policy has driven Ukraine away from Russia over the last decade, and that the Ukrainian problem is not so much a hardware problem of, you know, uh, guns and bombs, but a software problem of Ukraine as an example of a you know, democratic, with uh, all of its flaws, a system with a, a free press that's, you know, wants to integrate with the West in various ways and provides an alternative model. Um, you know, I think that is the kind of more, uh, the deeper threat and, you know, that that threat is only going to get worse uh, uh, unless Russia takes some kind of action. But the difficult problem that Russia faces is that, you know, its foreign policy tools are pretty blunt. Uh, you know, there's Russian soft power, um, you know, the much lauded Russian soft power, when you start to peel back, you know, Putin is a very um, uh, mistrusted leader, if you look at global public opinion surveys, if you look at people learning Russian in Central Asia, uh, and, uh, you know, that's going down, um, and actually all around the, the, the former uh, uh, Soviet states. Um, and, uh, you know, the notion that the Chinese are encroaching on Central Asia, that Ukraine is drifting away, um, that, uh, you know, I think those are the kind of deeper, more kind of what he might see as kind of existential threats uh, 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 to Russia. Um, and that, uh, you know, he has kind of consistently misread the Ukrainian, um, you know, Ukrainian public opinion and Russian public opinion uh, you know, about Ukraine. And the, the tragic element here is that, you know, if Putin had settled, I think, on, you know, the annexation of Crimea and then continued Russian policy towards Ukraine as before without, uh, you know, stoking the violence in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine and continuing to, you know, arm the, the, arm the rebels, uh, you know, that Russia could have still managed to uh, uh, get outcomes closer uh, to what it would like uh, than they've gotten with the you know, seven years of ongoing conflict uh, in Eastern Ukraine. So the no, I think in terms of Central Asia and Ukraine, the, the Kremlin might, see, might feel that time is not on their side. And this might be why we see the timing uh, for these kinds of moves in, uh, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine. Now, 
one of the points I make in the book is, uh, uh, you know, Putin does not discuss these issues with me personally. And uh, we need to be careful when we're really speculating about motives or speculating about um, intentions from troop movements, because they're all open to competing uh, interpretations. And what we, you know, we really would like, you know, harder evidence to make, uh, you know, to make some of these kinds of claims. But sometimes we're forced to speculate. And, you know, it seems to me that that might be one of the underlying motives behind, you know, Putin's approach to the near abroad. Well, I can't think of a better note on which to conclude than on the distinction between evidence and and speculation. And uh, I'll hold the book up once again, Professor Fry, for uh, such well-informed presentation of evidence and speculation. Uh, we have you to thank this afternoon, but also you know, we have you to thank on the printed page. So for those who haven't read the book, uh, I would encourage you to rush out uh, and read it. It's really a wonderful read and it, it, it truly couldn't be more timely. So Tim, thank you so much for joining us today uh, on The Long View. Uh, let me also thank uh, Sharona Harris and Victoria Pardini, Will Pomerantz and Matt Rojanski for helping to make uh, this discussion run as smoothly as it does. Please visit the Kennedy Institute website to stay up to date with publications and events and the Kennedy X podcast and the Russia file as well. Uh, and there is also lots of analysis uh, in the Russia file and on Focus Ukraine. Uh, and we'll see all of you in the new year uh, for our next iteration of this, this, this discussion. Thank you once again, Professor Fry. Oh, thank you. This was really terrific. I enjoyed it.